Title, Orientation to SAMHSA Programs, Resources, and Process. Speaker, Michael King, Ph. D. MSW. Good afternoon. My name is Antonio Neri from the CDC Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds, Pre Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship. Welcome to Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds for March 4th, 2020. Again, I'm Antonio Neri from the Division of Scientific Education and Professional Development. Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds is sponsored by the CDC Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship and the HRSA Bureau of Health Workforce. The CDC Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship provides 12 and 24 month full-time longitudinal service learning opportunities with senior public and population health leaders to physicians, veterinarians, and nurses who have completed the Epidemic Intelligence Service at CDC or have equivalent public health experience. For participants joining remotely, we use Adobe Connect for both the audio and presentation, but only use the chat box to pose and answer questions. Once the presentation is open, we will open, our speaker will answer questions either at the end or as he sees fit during the time. Continuing education credits are available for the live course up to one month after the presentation through the CDC Training and Continuing Education online portal. There is a link on the bottom left that you should be able to see that says PCEO links for files. The course code to get access to the continuing education credits is all capitals CDC PMRF. If you have any questions, please email the program at prevmed.cdc.gov. Please remember that the views presented by the speaker are theirs alone and do not necessarily represent the CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the U.S. government. I'm especially excited for this March Grand Rounds as I have both a friend and colleague to come and talk to you about a very important topic. Today we will be discussing orientation to SAMHSA programs, resources, and process by Captain Michael King, who is a regional administrator for Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The presentation will be approximately one hour with 30 minutes for questions and answers afterwards. Please welcome our presenter. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Neary. Uh, as, as was mentioned, my name is Michael King, and it's a pleasure to be here today. First off, I want to orient people to a handout that you can download, which is not comprehensive for this presentation, but it is in one of those little Adobe Connect pods in the lower corner, and I think it's the, the last file on that list. It's an activity that we'll talk about a little bit later, and it's just for fun, but I want to elevate that and make sure that you guys know that it's there. I, I believe the slides in PDF format are also there in case you want to have a, a slide deck to take home with you, or if you like any of the things you see in this presentation, go ahead and, and get those from that little download pod in the, I think it's the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Photo of a wall of glass and steel elevator door. Without further ado, you might have been expecting a dog or a pony for some of these type of presentations, but instead I'm giving you an elevator. That's what this is. Have you ever hopped on an elevator and had someone ask what you do or where you work, and you know you've only got about a minute or two to answer, and you also realize what they're really saying is, why does it matter to me? So. What we're going to talk about today, if you'll play along with me for maybe most of the next hour, I'm going to help you be better prepared to answer that question for whatever you do, whatever your line of work is, whatever profession you're in, wherever you work, but by paying attention to how I answer this question for SAMHSA. And the way I'm going to answer this question for SAMHSA is I'm going to use the three keys to public health success that I used to share with the officers I trained at CDC or in our U.S. Public Health Service Applied Mental Health teams. The first key is knowing who you are and why you do what you do. The second is helping others. And the third key to success is helping yourself. So I'm going to share 
who SAMHSA is, writ large, and what drives us. On the screen are three different keys used to open locks from the early 20th century. First key labeled with the initials SA, second labeled with the initials MH, and the third with the initials SA. I'm also going to share how we work with others to help, and I'm going to end with some resources that you can use immediately today to help yourself become a better, more informed, and effective public health professional. So you're going to need a sheet of paper for this, probably a pen, doesn't matter what kind of paper, you're going to want to be able to write somewhere. So if you're in the car, it's okay if you don't do this, you don't have to play along this way. Uh, you're, I put through the number 10 on here, but I think there are a total of like 16 items. So if you are an advanced organizer and you want to number this, go ahead and number all the way down through 16 for your own handout. The first key, as I mentioned, is knowing who you are and what's your why. Why are you doing what you're doing? Photo of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. Centers infuse the Center for Mental Health Services Open Brace CMHS Close Brace, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention Open Brace CSAP Close Brace, the Center Father Substance Abuse Treatment Open Brace CSAT Close Brace and the Center for Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality Open Brace CBHSQ Close Brace. Core beliefs, behavioral health is essential to health. Prevention works. Treatment is effective. People recover. This is who we are. This is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. This is our org chart at the highest 10,000 foot level. We have four centers that are organized around the offices of the Assistant Secretary. Our current and inaugural Assistant Secretary is Dr. Eleanor McCants Katz. The offices of the Assistant Secretary include our National Policy Lab and the Office of the Chief Medical Officer. I'm not going to go into details about what each of our centers do, but uh, we can save that for another in-person conversation or you can check it out online. But some of our core beliefs as an agency are written around the edges of this slide, and you can read those. You can also see a picture of our lovely SAMHSA headquarters in the background in Rockville, Maryland. This is actually, it makes it look really nice. It's, it's almost that nice in real life. So here's your first pop quiz. I want you to write the number one on your paper if you haven't already and answer the question, when do you think SAMHSA was founded? Was it 1945, 1984, 1992, or in 2002? Now this is this quiz and all of the questions that I'm gonna ask you throughout the next hour are on the honor system. So no Googling, no turning to the dude next to you. I'm gonna give you about another two seconds to, to think about it. And so the answer is we're a fairly young agency. We were established by Congress in 1992 and they did this by consolidating the treatment functions that were already in NIMH, NIAAA, and NIDA, as well as an older agency that was called the Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration, or ADAMA. So ADAMA became SAMHSA, if you wanted to pronounce it the same way, which is kind of interesting. This is SAMHSA's mission, but it's really just a fancy way of saying saving lives. Reducing the impact of substance abuse and mental illness on America's communities. And hopefully we all share this mission. This mission is way too big for any of us to do alone. And from SAMHSA's perspective, we're really looking for data that drive our decisions. We need resources to, to help ourselves do our job and to help you do your job. And then, of course, we're looking for partners in this business. So while 99% of our staff are in Rockville, we 10 RAs pictured here are your primary contacts in the region for anything related to mental or substance use disorders. Map PF the United States with regions numbered one through 10. Each region has a photo and identifying information of the regional administrator. We're your, your partners in this fight, basically. So if you look around, if you are not based out of Atlanta, Georgia, then Take a look at this map and see who your RA is and make sure you make contact with them. If you get nothing else from the next hour today, I want you to leave knowing how to contact me for more information. So just write down my email as the next item. Michael.king at samhs.hhs.gov. Email me. Here's the, here it is again. But make sure you write it down as item two. 
Map of the eastern half of the United States. Yellow lines connect stars in the different states. On screen text. We represent SAMHSA and communities connecting with stakeholders. Advance behavioral health engage target populations. Provide technical assistance. Promote program development, policy innovation, and system transformation. Lead federal behavioral health collaborations. Communicate regional trends, issues, policies. And we RAs do a number of different things. You can read a number of the, the tasks that we perform and, and a number of our roles here. But I think the most important function we serve is connecting rock stars like all of you. I like to think the way that this is just my silly way of thinking about it, but we, we create these constellations of awesomeness throughout our regions. And so this is a picture of region four with the constellation of awesomeness connecting all of the, uh, the folks working in these states. And because we're on a public health mission, all of these rock stars need data to drive their decision making. And those of you who are stationed at CDC know what I mean. This is, this is the primary approach for public health. And it's because we know that those data aren't just numbers. We know that those are real people. Those are real lives that are impacted by substance abuse and mental illness. So how many people do you think have a mental or substance use disorder? Take a second. Is it you know, around a million people in the US? Is it 17 million? Is it 47 million, 57 million, over 100 million? Take a second, think about it. Number three on your, make your own handout today. You know you're gonna get the answer in just a second. And the answer is, we know that almost 60 million Americans reported a mental and or substance use disorder according to the 2018 National Survey of Drug Use and Health. On screen text. In 2018, 57.8 million Americans had a mental and forward slash or substance use disorder. We know that 47 million had a mental illness. Oh, and I should go back. I mentioned the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, uh, or NISTA. For those of you who don't know NISTA, it's a comprehensive household interview survey, and it covers substance use, mental health, and treatment services. These, are, these data are collected from 50 states in D.C. There are nearly 70,000 people interviewed each year for NISTA. Uh, it's probably the most widely used source of data for information on mental health and substance use in our country, and it is SAMHSA's flagship survey. NISTA also tells us that 19 million people had a substance use disorder in the U.S. in 2018. And we know that there's also a significant overlap with millions having both a substance use disorder and a mental illness, which probably doesn't come as much of a surprise to you. On screen text, 9.2 million Americans have both mental illness and SUD. We know that serious mental illness is rising significantly among young adults and adults, and you can see the age groups plotted here on this figure, 18 to 25, are in red with that, that increasing line. The 26 to 49 year olds are in the middle with the dark blue, and then the 50 plus year olds are in the green at the bottom, and this covers the years 2008 to 2018. 18 to 25 years old have the steepest rise at 7.7%. 26 to 49 years old start higher in 2008, but decline until 2014, when they begin to rise again with a net gain of 5.9%. 50 plus maintain a relatively steady rate over the years, with a slight increase and then decrease with a net gain of 2.5%. Our data also show that depression with impairment is increasing among adolescents, at least since 2015, since we've been tracking it with this item. It's also increasing among young adults, those aged 18 to 25 years. So it really should come as no surprise that there's a crisis no one is talking about. We have a suicide crisis in our country right now, and we can't talk about opioid-related deaths or addiction without also starting to talk about suicide. So I want to take a second and highlight that. According to the last CDC Vital Signs report on this, almost every state has seen an increase over time in the last 15 years. In fact, we know that 25 states, there was a 30% plus increase over time, which is 
pretty shocking and crazy that this is on the news every day. Of the 50 states, Utah is the only state with a slight decrease. So I want you to think for a second about someone you love who's between the age of 10 and 24. Uh, when I think about that, my son is, is 23, my son Connor, and I think about him at the age of 10. And yes, these are silhouettes of the Incredibles. Just in case you were wondering, you're like, what is that all about? Well, think about this person, and I want you to write your name, their name down on your sheet. Right? Who, who's somebody that you know and or love between the age of 10 and 24? Picture their face. And then I want you to consider the suicide rate among people aged 10 to 24 increased 56% between 2007 and 2017. The really shocking thing is this made suicide the second leading cause of death for people in that age group from 10 to 24 that exceeded homicide. And this just blew my mind because I'm thinking, what kind of world are we living in that's driving 10 year olds to kill themselves? I mean, this is, this is a shocking finding which ought to drive a lot of people's public health practice. And what's even worse is that our 2018 NISTA data suggests these trends are continuing, at least for young adults. So the epidemic seems to be marching on. As you can see, this, this figure shows the, the thoughts, planning, or attempted suicide for this age group. Bar graph showing suicidal thoughts, plans, and attempts increasing for young adults open brace ages 18 to 25 close brace. Serious thoughts, 2.2 million in 2008 and 3.7 million in 2018. Make a plan, 643,000 in 2008 and 1.2 million in 2018. Attempted, 395,000 in 2008 and 647,000 in 2018. Of course, the data also shows that uh, having a co-occurring substance use disorder is associated with suicide because, duh, when did substance abuse make things better? Bar graph showing co-occurring SUD associated with suicidal thoughts plans and attempts among adults 18 and older. 1. Serious thoughts, no SUD, 7.6 million in 2008, SUD, 3.1 million in 2018. 2. Made a plan, no SUD, 2.2 million in 2008, SUD, 1.2 million in 2018. 3. Attempted, no SUD, 900,000, SUD, 542,000. Right. And we know substance use is more frequent among people with a mental illness. And you can see uh, daily cigarette use or binge drinking, and CDC has published a lot of new data on binge drinking that I would refer people to if we want to have a talk about alcohol. We're not going to get into that a lot today. Illicit substance use and misuse is also more common uh, among folks who have any mental illness, which is, yet again, not a surprise, but when the data back it up, you know. So... When it comes to discussing our most public or visible behavioral health crisis in the country, the increases in overdose dose deaths that every state has seen over the last several years, things start to make a lot more sense in the, in the context of what we know about mental illness and substance use. We're starting to move the needle which is encouraging. We know that the, the most recent National Center for Health Statistics data brief reported the drug overdose death rate was lower in 2018 than in 2017 in at least 14 states and DC. So 14 is better than zero, isn't it? But in 2017, and this is another one of those findings that you just go, wow. It's really important to note that, the, the, that overdose in general, just drug overdoses as a broad category, officially became the leading cause of unintentional injury-related death. That surpassed motor vehicle accidents. So this is the first time that happened in 2017. And guess what? If you're looking at the broad general category of drug overdoses, what's, what's the number one drug associated with overdose death? Chart of deaths in the United States, peak year, 1968, Vietnam War. 16,899 deaths. 1991, homicide, 24,703 deaths. 2015, suicides, 44,193 deaths. 1995, HIV/AIDS, 50,628 deaths. 1972, car accidents, 54,589 deaths. 2017, 
drug overdoses, 71,568 deaths. Opioids, leading cause of overdose death. So knowing that, knowing that 2017 was the peak and that you know over 71,000 people died of overdose in general that year, how many do you think died from overdose in 2018? Let's take a second. Let's see if you could predict the future. Well, this was the future. In 2018, how many people died from a drug overdose in general? Was it less than 47,000, 67,000, 87,000, 97,000, or was it just too many to count? This could be item number six on your page. I'll give you a second. Again, no Googling, no looking ahead at the slides. Here's your answer. A total of 67,367 overdose deaths occurred in the U.S. in 2018, which was a 4.1% decline from 2017, which is pretty good. That's awesome. The needle's moving in the right direction. But still, two-thirds of those involved opioids. And what we know is for every one person who died, 11 people had a heroin substance use disorder. This is also a decrease from previous years. And what we think is this downward trend was accounted for by the decline in use among young adults for heroin. So young adults, meaning those uh, 18 to 25 years are using less heroin overall, and that accounted for this. We also know that for every one person who died, 36 people reported prescription opioid use disorder. And this decrease reflects the decrease in prescription opioid misuse across all age groups that we were seeing in the 2018 data from NISTA. We know that for every one person who died, 220 people misused prescription opioids in the past year. And as you can see, uh, Pain reliever misuse and heroin use is uh, also down over time. Six bar graphs showing a decline in pain reliever misuse, a low but steady pain reliever use disorder and pain reliever misuse initiates. Also, a decline over time in heroin use, heroin use disorder, and an uneven up and down in heroin use initiates, ending with an increase in 2018. And this appears to be true, at least for prescription opioid misuse across all age groups since 2015. So with the 18 to 25 year olds in dark blue and the 26 year old plus year olds in green, we have the 12 to 17 year olds in red at the bottom of the figure. You can see from 2015 to 2018. So quick question. Line graphs show a decline in prescription opioid misuse across all age groups. Uh, those numbers are higher than we'd like. Where do you think people are getting those prescription pain medications that they're misusing? What do you think? Item number seven on your page, if you had to guess where they're, they're finding these medications. Take a second, think about where you might get some prescription medications if you wanted to use them. And here's your answer from the 2018 NISTA. We know that the majority continue to obtain from friends and relatives, which is that big chunk of gray pie, and from healthcare providers, which is the, or prescribers, which is the blue pie. And all this information really underscores is that we need to keep educating our practitioners. We need uh, more appropriate pain management still in this country, it's still an issue. Uh, and from an organizational SAMHSA's perspective, we need to be continuing our strong partnerships with states that monitor opioid prescribing. So that can maybe a, a condition of some of our grant funding that may be just some general relationship building that we have to do, but we want to keep those partnerships alive and monitoring that prescribing. Pie chart showing that 9.9 .9 million people aged 12 or older who misused prescription pain relievers in the past year. Slightly over one half are given by, bought from or taken from a friend or relative. Slightly more than one quarter got those prescriptions or stole from a healthcare provider. Less than one quarter got some other way, or bought from a dealer or other stranger. Finally, we know that for every one person who died, over a thousand, which scales up to about 15% of the U.S. population, filled at least one prescription for an opioid. I went to the dentist this last year, so I'm one of these people, or I would be one of those people in 2019. They prescribed me a medication that included opioids, and I was like, wow, 
there it is. This is it's reality. And you know, I didn't ask for that, but that's what automatically popped out of my dentist's office. So it's logical that non-fatal ED visits for opioid overdoses continue to increase year after year after year. In fact, our most recent data that were reported by the CDC from their ESOS system, that enhanced state opioid overdose surveillance system, showed that there was a 3.5% increase in at least 10 states. And that was between, uh, I think it's Q1 in 2018 to Q1 2019. Uh, you know, that's, it, it's still happening. In fact, an earlier version of this report is what showed that this is increasingly becoming a rural issue as well. It's not so much just uh, situated within urban areas. So uh, these data are really producing some interesting findings. And we know that because overdose deaths are closely linked, especially opioid overdose deaths, are closely linked to the illicit fentanyl supply, which is super lethal because of its potency. Uh, we know that deaths are going to keep going as long as that fentanyl supply keeps going. So we have a lot of work to do. We all have uh, pretty good job security right now, which is unfortunate. So um, yeah, a lot of stuff, but good news, good news nationally. I hate to be all doom and gloom. Good news is that the release of provisional overdose data that came out back in January showed that all overdose deaths across the country are still down about 0.2%. I think that's even changed now to it's gone up a little bit more uh, now that some more data have come in. Uh, overall, that was from June 2018 to June 2019. So that's a positive. But wait, I don't want to get too positive either. I'm going to balance it out. We haven't even talked about emerging issues. And there are lots of emerging issues. We're just going to talk about a couple of them. I want you to think about what you believe to be the most used illicit drug right now, given all the stuff we've talked about so far. I've been yapping at you for about you know, 25 minutes, and, and you know your communities well, you know people. What are, what are people using? Give you a second. All right, well, let's see. It's only somewhat illicit, only illicit some places, but it's the big green wave that's crashing down on many states right now, and it's on the way for probably all states at some point. It's marijuana. Uh, you know, if you take a look at the, the rates of use for all of the other uh, illicit drugs. Marijuana is really a standout. A horizontal bar chart of illicit drug use. Marijuana shows significant open brace 15% close brace increase from 2017 to 43.5 million. Psychotherapeutic drugs show a significant open brace 6.6% close brace decrease from 2017 to 16.9 million. Cocaine, 5.5 million. Hallucinogens, 5.6 million. Methamphetamines, 1.9 million. Inhalants, heroin, 808,000. And we wonder about this, and, and maybe it's because it, it really enjoys this very low perceived risk among folks, which is contributing to the significant increase in use disorder. It's particularly among those aged 18 to 25. So, what these data tell us is that we need to keep educating the public about the risks associated with marijuana use. Similarly, e-cigarette use, and hence nicotine addiction, is on the rise for adults. It's on the rise even among those who never smoked real cigarettes, which really hammers home or, or highlights the unintended consequence of something that was supposed to be a good way to help smokers quit. And instead, it's a great way to hook people on nicotine that were never hooked on nicotine before. Maybe worse, we have data that are showing this increase is happening among youth. This is, these are preliminary data from the Youth Tobacco Survey. Uh, I think this even goes up through 20, oh, it is, through 2019. Uh, you know, they tend to perceive e-cigarettes as safe because, of course, they were, you know, initially intended to be sort of a therapeutic alternative. And this issue interacts with marijuana use patterns because who knows what people are putting in these e-cigarette these e capsules and, and the little jewel modules. Two bar graphs showing a decline of time in the use of cigarettes and a dramatic increase in the use of e-cigarettes. So that's an issue to keep an eye on and, and we're all dealing with it. Now, finally, there's the star of Breaking Bad. 
Meth never went away, and Meth has officially announced its comeback tour now that we've been making some progress limiting its competitors. Uh, we've been seeing a decline in use among young adults, those 18 to 25 year olds, it looks like, at least in the latest year, but we're seeing a concurrent and significant increase in people aged 26 and older. So that is unfortunate. And the this is true for meth use disorders as well. So I, I, I want to specify this, this slide brings up the issue of the difference between uh, use or misuse and uh, disorders. Use or misuse is not a diagnosed disease. It's more of a pattern of behavior that is problematic or that could be problematic. In contrast, when you hear me talking about a drug use disorder, right, the clinical term for drug addiction, that really describes a complex disease that affects people's brains and their bodies. It, some, it has some characteristics. It's characterized by people using compulsively despite all of the serious health and social consequences. So they know it's going to do bad things to them, but they're still using, they can't stop and they're searching for it. It actually creates physical changes in people's brains, like the parts of people's brains responsible for reward or motivation or learning or judgment and memory. And it damages your, your body systems. So it, it, it's killing people and yet they can't stop using. And what we know about this is, uh, Drug use disorders are a chronic disease. People have a tendency to relapse and, and people have them for a really long time. So we're seeing this for meth, both use and misuse, as well as use disorders on the rise. Despite all of these problems and this burden, guess what? You know, we've, we've been doing a lot, but there are these enormous treatment gaps that exist, not just for substance use disorders, but for mental illness as well, you know, and so these are things that are not new. They've been around a long time. We've been throwing a lot of money and a lot of person hours at them, but for a lot of reasons, it's still tough to get people the treatment that they need and the right treatment they need at the right time. Bar graph showing the large percentage of SUD and mental illnesses that go untreated. So what are we going to do about all of these headlines? Right. These are some of the, the issues that I just mentioned. You know, we're giving people the data, we're collecting the data, we're communicating the data, but we know that data aren't enough. We're public health, so we're data driven and it's an important place to start. But what are we doing? You know, the, the data are why SAMHSA is doing what it's doing, and those data are people. I want you to take a second on item nine and, and write down what's, what's something that inspires you to do the work you're doing in prevention or in treatment or wherever you work. What, what is inspiring you to do this work? Is it one of the numbers that I just mentioned? Is it somebody that you know, maybe that 10 to 24 year old? Is it something that you've seen or something that you've experienced in your life? What's making you work in this field? Take a second and write it down. Let's get in touch with that before we move on to the next section. Okay. So hopefully you've taken a second and either written down your why or you're at least thinking about what's motivating you, what's inspiring you. Hopefully it has something to do with data because we're in public health. So that's important. Knowing what you're doing and why is, is how you have to start. That's the first key to success. But the second key to success in public health is partnership. And that means helping others because none of us can do this all alone. Now here's a rhetorical question. Image of $100 bill. I don't expect you to answer it. Why am I showing you Ben Franklin? I'm going to answer the question for you, but reflect on this. Obviously, you know, we all need resources to do our jobs. If, if our funding gets cut or if we can't afford to, you know, buy certain things or go certain places, we can't do our job. So, yep, it's, it's really all about the Benjamins. It really is. Don't let anyone tell you different. Now, the second reason, and I think a little more pertinent beyond the Benjamins, is that he's credited with a quote, and this is, I promise, I'll, only two quotes in this presentation. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. I love this quote because what I'm going to do for the next you know, 15 to 20 minutes is share with you how SAMHSA and the rest of Health and Human Services is supporting you to continue this fight from a population perspective. It's really a, a big picture approach. 
And we're going to start with a little game. This game relates to that handout that I mentioned is something you can download from the download pod or whatever in Adobe Connect. Uh, there's a crossword handout in there. This game is called Name That Partner. And you can play the full crossword later. We're just going to go through three of these. I'm going to read a description of an HHS agency. And I want you to write down the acronym for that agency, if you know it. If you don't know it, then I'm going to give you the answers in a second. Not right after, but I'll give them to you in a second. So here's your first one. Mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible. I'm not going to read the rest of it. You read it. Its mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable, and to work within HHS and with other partners to make sure that the evidence is understood and used. Note, crossword key, number 10 down. The, the answer key for this one is it's going to be 10 down. When I show you the answers, do you know do you know what agency this is? And by the way, all of these these agency definitions are from the HHS website. No cheating, don't go there. But this is where I got them. So, do you know who this agency is? Here's our next one. There's an agency that prevents exposure to toxic substances and the adverse health effects and diminished quality of life associated with exposure to hazardous substances. Statement continues from waste sites unplanned releases, and other sources of environmental pollution. Note, crossword key, number three across. The answer key is three across when I show you the answers. Do you know what agency this is? All right. Third and final test of do you know your HHS partners? This agency improves access and reduces barriers to high-quality effective programs and services for individuals who suffer from or at risk for addictive and mental disorders. Statement continues, as well as for their families and communities. Note, crossword key, number four down. The answer key is four down. I know this was a soft pitch, wasn't it? It was easy. So here are all of your answers. Yep, this is the big picture HHS players. They're all pictured here. We're all working for you. Of course, the handout also has all of these descriptions. You have the slide deck, so you'll have this answer key if you want to play this. I'm sure if you share this at parties, it'll make you very popular. You'll be able to name all of your HHS partners. But the important thing is to know that A, you've got partners at the federal level, and then B, beyond knowing what we all do, I want you to know that we have some plans. Crossword puzzle with logos of 12 agencies. And these plans are plans you should know about because you play a part in them. Pop quiz, item 13 on your handout, make your own handout. How many points does the HHS opioid strategy have? This is our nation's strategy for dealing with the opioids crisis. I'm not gonna give you a range of answers, you just decide, is it a thousand points? of light plan? Is it a one point plan? How many points does, does our national strategy for dealing with this have? If you were going to make a national plan for opioids, how many points would you have? Oh. Five point strategy for the opioid crisis. One, better addition prevention, treatment and recovery services. Two, better data. Three, better pain management. Four, Better targeting of overdose reversing drugs. Five, better research. The answer is five. Five is the magic number. You can learn more about this at hhs.gov forward slash opioids. And as I describe also what SAMHSA is doing programmatically with our partners, uh, I want you to see how it fits in with both this plan and it also fits in with SAMHSA's strategic plan. We have a strategic plan which covers from 2019 to 2023. https slash 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 about us slash strategize plan. You can go to this URL and you can check it out yourself. I want to highlight just a few things that are similar to the HHS plan. First thing is similar, we have five magical points as well. How convenient is that? So not just SAMHSA's plan, but HHS's plan. There's a five-point plan. Priorities overview. One, 
combating the opioid crisis through the expansion of prevention, treatment and recovery support services. 2. Addressing serious mental illness and serious emotional disturbances. 3. Advancing prevention, treatment, and recovery support services for substance use. 4. Improving data collection, analysis, dissemination, and program and policy evaluation. 5. Strengthening health practitioner training and education. We are also focused on opioids and then, more generally, mental illness and substance use. Because we're a public health agency, we're data-driven, so we're focusing on improving data. And then a big focus for us at SAMHSA is improving our workforce, training our practitioners, educating people like yourselves in how to be better providers of care. So hence, I'm, I'm on this lovely webinar today. This is something like that. This is our way of helping you guys become better prepared. So similar priorities to the HHS plan. SAMHSA as an agency is probably best known for our two huge block grants, which go out to states and other entities. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Prevention and Treatment Block Grant, which is the SABG on, on the left there. SABG, $1.8 billion. Uh, it targets prevention, treatment, and recovery services. A lot of money is going there, particularly since opioids uh, came on the scene. Our Community Mental Health Services Block Grant, the MHBG over there with 72 million, that targets adults with SMI and children with serious emotional disturbances. These grants, if, if you don't know much about block grants, the easiest way to think about them are there these really big, broad, uh, you know, in purpose grants that are administered by the states, and there are very few strings attached to them. We give all of this money to, to states, and they can kind of do what they want within uh, the the realm of the purpose of the, the grant. As a for example, we require that 20% of the substance abuse block grant award be spent on primary prevention. And here in region four, as a, as a neat for example, uh, the state of Tennessee has partnered with their public health authorities to work on primary prevention in rural areas. So they're, they're doing walkability studies, they're doing food security projects and food access projects, they're doing uh, transportation planning for rural areas to get people say if they need to go see their therapist or if they need to go pick up medication. So that's how some of our substance abuse block grant money is helping make communities more resilient, at least here in region four. And, and it kind of flies under the radar. People don't realize that SAMHSA is actually out there helping build more complete streets, but we really are. And, and that is all to do with the teams of people who are using these monies at the state and local level. Now, here's a pop quiz to make you a little more savvy in the SAMHSA world. What does SOR, STR, or TOR mean in SAMHSA talk? If you meet somebody from SAMHSA and you start whipping out these three letter uh, acronyms, I want you to know what you're talking about. Take a second. I don't care if you answer the SOR, STR, or TOR. If you get one right, you get them all right. The answer is opioid response grants. So in addition to our block grants, we're giving away a lot of opioid specific money. That was part of our strategic plan, also part of the HHS plan. Almost a billion dollars to states and millions to tribes. SOR, state opioid response grants. STR, state targeted response grants. TOR, tribal opioid response grants. $1.5 billion to all 50 states, territories, and six specific jurisdictions. These are all focused on expanding prevention, treatment, and recovery services. We also specify that there should be a set aside for tribes and a set aside for, like I think there's a 10% set aside for the 10 hardest hit states by the opioid crisis. So states that had really uh, high burden got um, money set aside for them. To get a little more specific on some of our programs, in fiscal year 2020, we give out more money to expand strategic evidence-based treatment. A couple of examples are strategic prevention framework partnerships for success grants, which really focus on strengthening prevention capacity and infrastructure. Uh, or, you know, from a treatment perspective, there's this smaller, I think it may be a pilot project, the Comprehensive Opioid Recovery Center grants, which support centers that will provide a full spectrum of treatment services for opioids, and that includes medication-assisted treatment. So these are some examples of how we're really targeting the issue. 
Now, take a second. Who's got one of these in their pocket? Narcan nasal spray. Or who has one of these within easy arm's reach? Or who knows exactly where to go get one of these now? Is it over by the AED? Do you even know what it is? It's a Narcan nasal spray container. And if you don't already know how to administer naloxone, I want you to consider seeking out a free training, maybe getting a dose or two to carry around. Put it on your to-do list if you haven't done this already, because we know that there are a lot of deaths due to opioids going on, and SAMHSA is working to expand access to and safe administration of naloxone. So with almost doubling the funding over the last couple of years, it's a life-saving medication that anyone can administer, anyone at all, and you can immediately reverse an overdose. We know that our programs are working because the data show a dramatic increase in naloxone dispensing from U.S. pharmacies. Over 270,000 kits, I think, have been distributed to date. So the data shown on this slide are, are out of date. In fact, you know, we surpassed the HHS goal a year ago. And even better, the, the last data point in 2019 from our SAMHSA grantees on this showed that there were over 10,000 overdoses reversed. That is 10,000 lives that were saved by funding naloxone distribution. So if you're not part of that success, go become part of that success. Go get training, get some Narcan. Other programs that we highlight, we, we provide resources to special population issues like prevention and treatment for pregnant women and uh, addressing neonatal opioid withdrawal uh, with millions of dollars there because we know we're if, uh, from our 2017 NISTA data that uh, use during pregnancy was on the increase. But now, based on our 2018 data, we know that our programs are working because trends are moving in the right direction with decreases in past month substance use during pregnancy which is a, a pretty shockingly fast turnaround based on, on some public health intervention. Graphs showing substance use trends among pregnant women with significant reductions in the use of illicit drugs, tobacco products, alcohol, marijuana, opioids, and cocaine. And guess what? This is even true when we compare women who were not pregnant to women who are pregnant, which is pretty exciting. This is so, so important because we saw data findings at SAMHSA. We uh, addressed that with monies for prevention and programs to address uh, drug use during pregnancy. And now we see evidence that that prevention is working based on surveillance. And, and so that's just a neat thing to me. Another special population that we're focused on are our population involved in the criminal legal system. We are supporting drug courts. If you don't know about drug courts, check them out. They're a really amazing uh, innovation uh, where grantees can use 20% of their award for medication assisted treatment. Uh, they can help divert people. So we have jail diversion programs. Uh, in the first year that we were funding jail diversion programs, I think it was 2016, there were over 16,000 individuals who were diverted into SAMHSA supported programs instead of going to jail. We produce guidance like the two guidance documents that you see on the screen. Uh, which are free to download, by the way, if you want to check them out and read them. We also work with offender reentry programs. So our grantees can link people to services even before they get released from jail because we know that people, especially those who had been addicted to opioids, are at a radically increased risk of death within just the first couple of weeks of release from jail. We know we can't arrest our way out of this problem. And our partners in the criminal legal system are on board with this. They realize that too. And, and it's, it, what's so amazing is people will literally go to a safe station program, a police station, which is enrolled in the safe station program, and, and they will ask for help. They will turn in their illegal drugs and the police will take them to treatment instead of taking them to jail. It's pretty awesome. And if you haven't checked out these programs, I encourage you to do a little more digging. Download two resorts at HTTPS slash slash store dot gov slash system slash file slash sma19 to 5097.pdf. So another thing in fiscal year 2020 that we are maintaining our focus on is suicide prevention. National strategy for suicide prevention open brace NSSP close brace and suicide prevention resource center. 
National Suicide Prevention Lifeline 1 to 800 to 273. Talk. www.suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Uh, I've listed three of our programs for fiscal year 2020 that that are out now. Uh, the Zero Suicide and Health Systems and the National Strategy, et cetera. We also are continuing our funding for some longstanding, really successful programs like our Suicide Prevention Lifeline that people can call at any time. Uh, another neat one are our Governors and Mayors Challenges. This map shows, actually, I think I highlighted in red, there's our Region 4 participants, Atlanta, Clarksville, Tennessee, Jacksonville, Jacksonville Florida, Hillsborough County, Florida, Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, those are in Region 4. But what this program does is it trains key community leadership teams to identify and help with service members, veterans, and their families who may be at risk for suicide. So it's a really exciting program. Uh, Again, another way to get involved. And if you want to find out more about what Grant SAMHSA is offering, how we're spending your tax dollars, where are the Benjamins going, We tell you online, click on the grants. You can also see the trainings that we provide to people. You can find who's eligible for what grant. So if you know an organization which is hurting for some money, recommend they go here, have them poke around, see what's going on. And you know, if you're like me and you're wondering who has your tax dollars, where is SAMHSA sending your money? Guess what? We have a map. You can click on whatever state you live in And you can find out who in your state got SAMHSA money, what they did with it. And you could even reach out to them and say, hey, is there a chance to be involved? Now, if you're in, uh, you know, your office one day and you're you're looking for help beyond grants, we have this really neat National System of Technology Transfer Centers, which is just for you. Since 2018, we've broadened this to... uh, um, provide technical assistance to non-grantees so anyone can contact it. This shows our addiction technology transfer centers. And in the first two years of this expanded model, it, they've provided help to over 50,000 healthcare professionals in just two years, right? They produce cool resources like this uh, rural school mental health resource guide. And these are the links to their landing page. One, addition TTC, HTTPS, slash slash network.org. 2. Mental Health TTC. HTTPS slash slash mhttcnetwork.org. 3. Prevention TTC. HTTP slash slash pttcnetwork.org. I encourage you to go check around. They have vast free libraries of trainings and resources. But here's something that's even neater, I will say. In Region 4, we have three technology transfer centers in our region. And for those of you who are near Emory University here in Atlanta, we have the only mental health technology transfer center that's situated in a school of public health. Ben Druss over there at Emory, go walk over. He's a really nice guy, very welcoming. But if you're not in Atlanta, if you're not near Emory, maybe you're in a rural area, guess what? We have rural opioid technical assistance programs. And they're located all over the country. But here in region four, we have two of them. And here's the coordinator's information as well. You can reach out to Umberto, or you can contact David or Amy, and they'll let you know what's going on in related to rural in their states. Sirota contact, humberto.carvalho at smsa.hhs.governor Mississippi State University, David Nyes, drb73 at meestate.edu, North Carolina State University Raleigh, Amy Chilcote, achalco at ncsu.edu. And also in the region. So reach out to them. That's what they're there for. To help our workforce develop, we've expanded the evidence-based treatment by issuing guidelines and and resources for serious mental illness through things like SMI Advisor. So this website is always up. It supports real-world clinical practice through education, data, consultations. You can contact them. We do the same thing for opioids with medication-assisted treatment through the Provider Clinical Support System. So this provides 24-hour Data 2000 waiver training. And if you don't know what that is, that just allows people to prescribe uh, the FDA-approved medications for opioid abuse without uh, being in an opioid treatment center. Uh, It provides CEUs. It has webinars and mentoring. So if you're interested in working in this area, this is your resource. Furthermore, we know that all crises and disasters are local, so we provide rapid state-targeted technical assistance. 
through our opioid response network. This is really our partnership with the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry and 27 partner organizations. HTTPS slash slash opioid response network dot org. They will respond to your requests via this uh, email form in usually within about 24 hours. If you want to see everything we think that works, everything that's evidence-based, we put it all in one place in 20, I think April of 2018, the Evidence-Based Practice Resource Center. So instead of just hunting around and Googling at random, why don't you go to SAMHSA's website and check out our, our resource center? The coolest thing there, I will say, is our Behavioral Health Treatment Locator. This is neat. It's super broad. It includes facilities for substance abuse, mental health, what have you. Uh, it's just not super user-friendly. And we've seen the launch of findtreatment.gov. And I'm going to go back, look, there's a SAMHSA in the URL for our locator. And then findtreatment.gov, no SAMHSA in that title. Th these will get you to the same places if it's related to substance abuse. But findtreatment.gov just doesn't have a lot of the other stuff. So it's not quite as robust, but it's a little more user-friendly. HTTPS slash slash findtreatment.gov slash or HTTPS slash slash findtreatment.gov. So look for our treatment locator to be reshaped in the near future. Another resource that you can go to for our partners is Suicide Prevention Resource Center. You can go to your state and find out how to get involved in your state. HTTPS slash slash sprc.org slash. If you're wondering what you can do to make a difference about suicide, go there. We support centers of excellence for uh, um, issues of, of public health importance, things like uh, first episode psychosis, uh, as a, for example, this Early Assessment and Support Alliance Center of Excellence. We have a site in case you're interested in finding recovery resources. Go here. This Technical Assistance Center will provide you with uh, different strategies for building recovery supports in your community. Bringing recovery supports to scale. Technical Assistance Center Strategy. HTTPS slash slash www.samhsa.gov slash brss tacs and you don't have to shop around these are experts in this i have to end with or well, i have to end this part with data we're always working to improve and expand our surveillance we're adding new questions to the national survey on drug use and health like about medication assisted treatment and those emerging issues our 2018 data are out now in these reports you know we have these behavioral health barometers for your state. Uh, so if you haven't downloaded your barometer, go and get that. We reinstituted the um, Drug Abuse Warning Network, which is a syndromic surveillance system now. And these are the Q1 data, which show, I think it's data from the, the first 35 that were enrolled in 2019. And our goal is to have 50 enrolled by the end of 2020. These data have, show some interesting trends. Bar graphs show the trends in substance use and emerging issues in rural, suburban, and urban communities. Total methamphetamine use one-third higher than the next highest use, marijuana. Particularly related to the toxicity of meth, uh, but, you know, we'll see what happens later. And finally, this is really exciting. If you like to play with the numbers yourself, then you could go to SAMDA, and we have access to our public data sets as well as uh, interactive maps. So if you don't want to code, if you're not feeling like that and working with the raw data, then you can just use our interactive uh, data wizards to find information. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Data Archive. SAMHDA. HTTPS slash slash www.datafill.samhsa.gov. slash info slash analyze data in 6. SAM duh. A lot of people don't know about this. It's underutilized. Uh, again, make you very popular at parties if you talk about this. So which one of these things are you going to do? Item 15 on your list. Are you going to search our training library at our, our technology transfer centers? Are you going to download a, a NISTA behavioral health barometer for your state? Are you going to go to our grants page and see what we're offering? Are you going to enroll in a Narcan training? Uh, what are you going to do in the, say, look, I'll give you a month. In the next month, what are you going to do? Take a second. Commit to some kind of action in the next month, right? We've already decided what inspires us to public health action. Now this is some action. And the third and final key, 
helping yourself. By this, I mean finding things that you can use right now, not waiting a month, but these are things you can use now to be more successful. So we're going to talk about a few things like this. These are things you can go online and get right now, like our SAMHSA Opioid Overdose Prevention Toolkit, comprehensive collection of stuff. HTTPS slash slash store dot SAMHSA dot gov slash system slash file slash SMA 18 to 4742 dot PDF. Download it. We produce a couple of these neat publications. I say new-ish for tip 63 about medication-assisted treatment because this field is changing so, so rapidly. We published it, and then we had to take it back down and revise it. It's, it's under revision now. It'll be coming out pretty soon. New resources. HTTPS slash slash store dot SAMHSA.gov. But you see we even produce clinical guidance for our, some of our special populations, like pregnant women. Suicide safe. No bullying. SAMHS a disaster app. Alcohol FX. Talk. They hear you. HTTPS slash slash store dot SAMHS a dot GLV slash apps. If you haven't downloaded any of our apps, I encourage you to go download some of our apps. I've had the disaster app on my phone for, uh, for years and years as part of a, a first responder for PHS mental health teams. Uh, another cool app is the Suicide Safe app. It, has all of resources at a, at a touch, and so you want to be prepared for this kind of thing if somebody asks you for help. For old school providers who want to have paper, we produce pocket guides for medication-assisted treatment. HTTPS slash slash store dot SAMHS dot GLV slash product slash medication-assisted treatment of opioid use disorder pocket guide slash SMA 164892PG. That's important. You can download it at that URL. If you're working with people who want to make these decisions for themselves, maybe they don't trust a, the physician or their therapist and they want to explore their treatment options on their own, we produce guidance on that. Decisions in Recovery, Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder Handbook, HTTPS, slash slash store dot SAMHS dot gov slash system slash file slash SMA 16 to 4993.pdf. So you could download this and hand it to them and say, here, do some reading, help yourself. Another neat thing is our partnership with NIDA. You can download this guide now. If you want to find out the evidence base supporting medication-assisted treatment, uh, it is all compiled in one place right here. Medications for Opioid Use Disorder Save Lives. HTTP slash slash www.nationalacademies.org slash HMD slash report slash 2019 slash Medications for Opioid Use Disorder Save Lives ASPX. I encourage you to at least poke around and read it. Maybe don't download it. It's big. Definitely don't print it. Here's another suggestion. You could run a communities talk event in your community to address underage drinking. We have a toolkit to show you how. It covers like social media. It covers how to talk to the press about this. It covers all the planning steps. Communities Talk Events Host Toolkit. HTTPS slash slash stop alcohol abuse dot gov slash town hall meetings slash getting started slash communities underscore talk underscore host underscore toolkit underscore 508 dot pdf so if you're not really sure how you would put this event on you can buy or buy you can download our toolkit and send me some money or download timely infographics we have the tips for teens on neff we've got marijuana we've got a ton of other infographics and fact sheets uh, the download, you could get those today. And here's another neat thing that I just learned about recently. We, we sponsor this national network focused on disparities in behavioral health. And these are a bunch of people who are working for the same mission that you're working for. It's free to join this network. You can then look and see who in your community is working on what, and they'll see what you're working on. Accepting cultures, preventing suicide in the Latinx community. HTTPS slash slash nned.net and it's a great way to stay connected and find partners in your community i want you to all mark your calendars for national prevention week it happens in may there are a number of things that you can do the prevention challenge last year was was identifying who you feel inspired by to do prevention work so if you have never been involved in prevention week activities uh, go check out this website and there are a number of ways that you can get involved at least mark your calendar also mark your calendar for Child Mental Health Awareness Day. That's coming up. I don't know the exact date. It's, I think it's the first week in May. Uh, I should have checked that. HTTPS 
slash slash www.samhsa.gov slash children awareness day. You can find out more information at this URL here. Now, I want you to commit to some action on that. What of these resources, we just flew through them, what resources are you going to use immediately? Are you going to mark your calendar for one of those events? Are you going to download a toolkit or an infographic? Are you going to check out what suicide prevention resources are available in your state? What are you going to do? I want you to commit to an action. All right. So as you're committing to an action, as you're trying to think what I'm, what I'm going to do today, I want you to think about the next quote. This is, only, this is the second and last quote of the, the presentation. Two boxers face off in the ring. Mike Tyson has his fist drawn back to punch Evander Holyfield. And it comes from Mike Tyson. So uh, as Mike put it, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, don't they? So just having data and just having resources is not nearly enough. It's necessary but not sufficient to do our job. And so we need to have tools to take care of ourselves. Like if you burn yourself out by sitting around watching webinars all day. So we're going to do a little bit of behavioral health uh, personal protective equipping in the next few minutes to wrap up this webinar. So I want you to stand up unless you're driving. <laughs> if you're in a place to stand up safely, please stand up. I'm not going to know if you do or not. I want you to take a couple of breaths in through your nose, blow them out through your mouth, blow them out. Now we're going to do a structured breathing activity. You know, breath is so important. It's the one uh, unconscious activity of our body that we can have some conscious control over, and it's directly linked to our nervous system. So I want you to inhale through your nose for four counts. I want you to hold it for four counts. I want you to exhale for four counts. And then hold that for four counts. And then keep going. Maybe repeat that four times on your own. No one can see you. No one knows. Inhale, hold, exhale, hold. This box breathing will allow you to calm down a little bit. Now that you're standing up, maybe you're feeling a little re-energized. You can do this anywhere. Your next step is going to be to focus or refocus on what's important right now. Maybe you've gotten a little distracted or maybe sometime you're, you're driving or you're feeling a little anxious or whatever and you need to refocus. So here's a drill. Look around you and I want you to acknowledge three things that you can see that don't bother you at all. Three things you're totally okay with. Look around, you can write them down or acknowledge them or whatever, just notice them. And then look around and, and see three things you can touch or feel that don't bother you at all. And then I want you to listen for three things you can hear that don't bother you. Now that you're breathing, now that you're grounded, who recognizes this? A man faces the corner of a room that is composed of a matrix of yellow squares. No, I can't. If we were in person, then I could actually see if you recognize this. For those of you who don't know, this is the iconic holodeck from the show Star Trek. And those of you who didn't watch the show, the, the room could turn into any place that you wanted to go. For the Harry Potter fans in the world, this is like the room of requirement, right? But it could turn into anywhere. And so, for example, the crew of the Enterprise, like Captain Picard here, would go into the holodeck and he would turn it into his field in the, the south of France. And there are his favorite pit bull is waiting for him, and that's how he would recharge. So guess what? You can do this too. You can have your own personal holodeck anytime you want. I want you to just save a picture of your favorite place on your phone and pull it out whenever you need to go to your safe and happy space. As a for example, this is a picture on my phone of uh, me driving into Joshua Tree where I go every December to do some rock climbing. And when I see this picture, I'm immediately no longer in this webinar. I am on that road going to Joshua Tree. So think about where you would go. What's your picture? Take a second right now. This is protected time. 
This is work, right? Figure out your happy place. All right. So we've come to the end of that road. Now that you're breathing, you're refocused, you're in your happy place, let's total your score, right? We've alleviated all anxiety. Total your score. Give yourself one point for each correct answer that you wrote on your handout. Should range from zero to 16, I believe, if I counted correctly. If you counted differently, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but give yourself, a, give yourself a total, and I want you to figure out what your SAMHSA Ninja level is. So if you scored zero to three, or if you didn't even bother to do the handout, you're that little ninja deer in headlights over on the left. If you scored between four and 10, then you're this, you know, standing up, getting focused, getting, getting ready, you know, ninja in the middle, like you're ready to go, you've got some information. If you scored 11 or more, or if somehow you ended up with like 20 on your, your thing, then you are the game on Samson Ninja. You could be giving this webinar, right? you are prepared and ready to go. So with that, you know, it really doesn't matter your ninja level either. If you remember the three keys of success that I talked about, if you remember who you are and why you're doing the work you're doing, whatever that work is, if you remember to help other people and work with partners, and if you remember to take care of yourself, whether that's downloading a fact sheet or standing up and doing some breathing exercises and going to your happy place, then you're going to be successful at public health. Because from SAMHSA's perspective, how we answer that elevator question is we're working with you to save lives. And we have resources that can help because we know that there's no health without behavioral health. On screen text, how to answer the elevator question. Our mission is saving lives. We and our grantees are your partner. We have resources ready to help. Behavioral health equals health. So with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. It's been about a good hour, and I'd, I'd love to answer some of your questions. SAMHSA's mission is to reduce the impact of substance abuse and mental illness on America's communities. Find treatment.glv 1-877-726-4727. One eight hundred four eight seven four eight eight nine. Open brace. TDD. Close brace. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Super informative. I really, really appreciate it. <clears throat> Again, <clears throat> what we're going to do is we'll change the chat the format here to have the chat box a little bit bigger, so uh, I can read it, and so you can type in questions. You can read your own questions. If you have questions for for Dr. King, please write them in the chat box below. I thought I would start off with. Uh, my own question, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you talked a little bit about it, but I wonder if you could expand us slightly on it with resilience and uh, evidence base for resilience training in communities or building the, building the evidence bases for that within SAMHSA. <clears throat> I don't know if that's something, feel free to say no. Say no to that. So, so your question is uh, building an evidence base for, a base for resilience training within communities. Is that right? Okay, so there, there are a couple of things that come to mind when we talk about resilience. And, you know, for just a quick uh, back of the napkin definition for resilience, it's the ability to bounce back. And I mentioned how some of our block grant funding is set aside for primary prevention. So I think about this a lot. When I think about the, the public health approach to solving problems, and I think about the, the story that, that we all know about of the, the person walking by a river and they're walking by this river on a beautiful day and then suddenly they hear some screaming and they see somebody floating down the middle of the river and they're like, oh my gosh. And so they run over to the river, they jump in, they drag the person out of the river and they're like, whew, good thing I got here in time. And then no, no sooner do they get the person to the side of the river, but they hear another scream and they're like, holy cow. And they run back in the river and they drag this other second person out of the river and they're like, wow, this is crazy. Two people in a river at the same time. And then they hear more screaming. And at the same time, they see a person on the other side of the river running upstream. And they're like, hey, man, help me out. There are these people in the river because, you know, it's getting exhausting pulling people out. And, and the guy was like, hey, man, you do that. I'm going to go up here and see why they're falling off the bridge in the first place. And so, you know, that, that idea that we want to prevent problems um, rather than catch them after the fact 
I, I mention this because when we're talking about primary prevention from a behavioral health perspective, we're talking really about building resilient communities. And so a lot of the, the work that SAMHSA is partnering with public health on has to do with building resilient communities. So having communities that can talk about hard problems, having communities that have access to food and transportation and resources. Uh, and one way I think about resilience from a behavioral health perspective, when I'm working with SAMHSA, you know, we, we, we sponsor these, these events. So I mentioned that one about underage drinking, but you know, these, there are other events like, you know, communities talk and, uh, other other ways to bring people together uh, around an issue in your community, which makes that community better able to handle problems. Uh, if any of you watched that recent movie about Mr. Rogers that was on either Netflix or um, whatever that streaming service is, you know, he, one of the one of the quotes. I, I can't believe I'm going to quote. Tom Hanks quoting Mr. Rogers, but Tom Hanks quoting Mr. Rogers was like, anything that's mentionable is manageable was a quote from that movie. And I thought that was really salient and pertinent to what SAMHSA does because we encourage people to talk about problems and we encourage people to build resilience through partnerships and through focused effort. So our evidence base is coming from those programs at the, the local the community, the state level. I mentioned uh, some of the work we're doing in prevention with pregnant women, uh, and there's a whole series of programs that tar target that. Uh, but within literally less than a year of us receiving data that this was a, a population which needed to be focused on, our programs were able to move the needle on a national level related to, to past month substance use among pregnant women, which is amazing. That is an amazing thing. And so that's what I think of when I think of resilience. I, I could talk for another hour or two on, on this in the disaster world, because we talk a lot about how we build resilient responders and how we build resilient, uh, disaster resilient communities. But I think any community that has access to services, that has access to uh, food and transportation and housing and jobs for, for all people, not just people who don't have a mental illness or not just for people who don't have substance abuse, that's, that's resilience to me. I hope that sort of answers your question. Wonderful, thank you. Um, <clears throat> some of the people have said I, it's not uh, loud enough, so I'll speak a little bit louder. Um, one of the questions comes from our participants and it talks about uh, a person who just wrote two HRSA grant proposals for addiction medicine tying addiction, addiction medicine specialists to primary care providers through telehealth. How does SAMHSA envision the role of telehealth technology in addressing the OUD epidemic? Great. I, so I love questions about telehealth. Um, we, we, at SAMHSA, we sponsor a number of, of telehealth initiatives, the, knowing that particularly in rural parts of the, the United States, which is a huge chunk of the United States, there's just no way for people to get to treatment easily. And so telehealth is becoming the major way we, we are addressing that. Uh, we, for those of you who are interested, I encourage you to look up Project Echo. Go ahead while you're listening to this, open another browser window and just Google Project Echo. I won't uh, go in. I know we don't have a lot of time, but check that out. Uh, I will. I, I'm just going to share an anecdote from Region Four that's specific to this. Uh, in Florida, the area agencies on aging have been struggling to get telehealth for behavioral health reimbursed for their seniors, and so just one way that SAMHSA is supporting that. Our regional office is convening a meeting of the the state authorities. Uh, local agencies that provide telehealth to people of all different ages, uh, the, the CMS regional administrator, the administration for community living administrator, myself, we're all meeting with all of these stakeholders uh, actually in two weeks. And we're, we're going to lay out an action plan for Florida to improve access for seniors to telehealth for behavioral health. And so 
you know, where we don't have this mechanism already in place, we are working to bring people together on the issue. And again, like I, like the three keys to success, we, we've got to have partners. You know, SAMHSA passes a lot of money through to other people and we can produce a lot of resources. But um, for telehealth specifically, you know, we will, we will fund projects that support that because we know that that's a great way to improve access to care. Thanks. Thank you. And, and, and I, I wanted to add, too, um, this is Tony at the Private Med Program. I was just at the annual ACGME conference for all the residency program directors out there. And the American Association of Medical Colleges, AAMC, I believe, is putting together a list of competencies uh, needed for telehealth training in residency. And if you're interested in getting more involved in telemedicine or how to best accomplish graduate medical education through telemedicine, I would encourage you to reach out to them. I know uh, there are a number of interested parties there, too. So there's certainly a, a neat um, field that is, is uh, burgeoning and uh, not well, ex uh, well explored on the graduate medical education side, but certainly getting more attention. The second um, uh, question is from one of our residents. He says, could you talk a little bit more about the organizational structure of SAMHSA and how regional offices coordinate with uh, the headquarters, and how big is the regional office in Atlanta? Um, and, and sort of as an aside to that, I'd be interested in t having been uh, yourself been a cdc -er for a number of years. Um, uh, to talk a little bit about your role now as a as a convener and how, how that is different from your prior work in the uh, CDC. Yeah, so I I love to talk about our relation to the mothership, and part of the reason is exactly what what you just mentioned. Uh, having having spent most of my career at CDC in the mothership supporting state health departments. This is this is sort of the reverse of that. I, I find myself now mostly living in state health departments trying to get messages back to the mothership. And what's what's really neat is, you know, we have the so the four centers again um, at SAMHSA, for those of you who don't have that slide pulled up right now, we have the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, and the Center for Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality. And fortunately, the, the names are, are fairly self-explanatory, right? These, each of these centers shares different roles. You know, obviously the, the center's name that has statistics in it, that's the center that's responsible for most of our surveys, NISTA being our flagship survey, but we have a number of other data sources and surveys that we, we coordinate that really nobody else has, not even NCHS. Um, and I am in no way saying that we're even close to NCHS in, in, in scope or scale, but uh, we do have some very special data sources. The other centers are really responsible for managing all of these programs and this funding. And when you think about why an organization like SAMHSA that has between 500 and 600 people at any given time, it's a really small agency, uh, why we would have people out in the regions, you know, the reason is, again, those three keys to public health success. We, we have to have partnerships. We have to have people who can understand the problems at a local and regional level and then help those people in the local or state or regional area use the resources that are generated by this very small federal agency in DC. So we're the bridge to uh, all, of, all of the SAMHSA resources, really. And uh, I included, a, I, I think, a, a slide with the, the Region 4 constellation with a bunch of the different roles that our, our regional administrators play. Um, I like the idea of connecting people, but we, we do a number of other things as well. Uh, we will represent the assistant secretary at meetings, so we will we'll help uh, amplify her message uh, at, at meetings because there's only one of her, and of course we have 50 states, and so in, within our regions, we, we like 
to be that representative. Uh, we will help all of the other HHS agencies work together uh, to prioritize behavioral health because anyone who's worked in, say, disaster response knows behavioral health is always the last to be invited to the table. Uh, so we try to, to help people prioritize behavioral health. Um, yeah, so that we really serve as that, that regional voice for this very small agency. And I will say, regional offices are super small, but here's the good news. We have just doubled the size of SAMHSA's regional presence. So each regional office has just doubled in size. What does that look like in Atlanta? We now have two people in Atlanta. <laughs> we have two people in each region. So we have a, a regional administrator and we have an assistant regional administrator. <laughs> so we're an office of two now, uh, which is it's kind of funny. And um, we have eight states, we have six tribes, we have two SAMHSA employees to, to really help make this stuff happen. But, you know, that is, it's progress. It's fantastic. The, the investment on the agency level to double our regional presence speaks to the success of this model. They understand that, that, you know, we could do a little bit with one person in each region, but we can do so much more uh, with another person. So I hope that answered that question. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about SAMHSA working with the Indian Health Service? Get a little bit. Yeah. Into that, maybe a little bit more. I can. I can definitely speak to that on a fairly so uh, in in two ways. Um, I can speak to it in in the way that all of our regional offices work with IHS and tribes. Uh, some of our regions have more tribes than others, and every region has an annual. Uh, consultation with the tribes that where we, we meet with them, we share our resources, we hear about what they need, and we work with them just like we would any state government. So there, it's really a chance to um, be a bridge between SAMHSA and tribal needs as well. So every region does that. The other, some regions that are more either disaster prone, like region four, we, you know, we have a lot of hurricanes, we have a lot of other disasters and some other regions have other, not necessarily natural disasters, but they maybe their tribes experience suicide clusters more often, um, which is unfortunate. And you know that this happens a lot. PHS mental health teams respond to those, but SAMHSA is a key partner in helping tribes deal with behavioral health crises. So as a for example, uh, a, a mental health team that I led a few years ago um, responded to a tribe that had experienced a suicide cluster and the SAMHSA regional administrator, Charlie Smith, helped get that tribe a, a huge grant to help fill some of the gaps in, in health services on, on tribal lands. And as a direct result of our mental health team's involvement and SAMHSA being there on the ground, understanding what the tribe needs. If that RA hadn't been there, if Charlie Smith hadn't been present and involved in that process, that tribe would not have gotten that grant. So uh, we, we work with tribes, we work with IHS to meet the needs of tribes uh, in, in a number of different ways, but those are the two that are really most salient to me. Um, some of our uh, our RAs who have more tribes, this is region four, we have six, but some of the other regions have a lot more, have, have much more involvement. Thank you. Thank you. One of the questions comes, it says, does SAMHSA have plans to fund substance use epidemiologists in state health departments? Talk a little bit more. You talked a little bit about this, but maybe expand upon that a little bit. So uh, do we have plans to fund substance abuse epidemiologists? Well, not that I know of, but here's, here's a neat thing. So I, I've been talking with some CSTE fellow alums about how the, the alumni network of CSTE fellows might uh, collaborate with our regional administrators. Um, so that's something that, that I'm trying to cook up. I know that one of our regional administrators is interested in recruiting a PHAP fellow from CDC. And so we're going to see how that goes. Uh, so I think that that's going to be interesting. And 
beyond that, whether we fund directly an epi position, you know, we absolutely work and our and our grantees work alongside the the public health folks in each state. So when I go to any state health department, one of the the first people that I meet with is their state epi. And that's a legacy maybe of my time at CDC when when the state epis were our our primary stakeholder. But now I do it because I see it's an opportunity to break down a silo that may or may not be there uh, within states and make sure that the, the public health entities understand that I'm not just there to meet with behavioral health authorities, I'm there to meet with all the all the folks involved in public health, and there's always so much overlap that the you know their epis are often working, um, you know, on things that are absolutely relevant to the SAMHSA mission. I hope that answered that question. And and probably yeah. there's funding that comes through a block grant, like a. States are able to allocate some of their block grant funding. I don't know exactly that's yeah. the way it works. If they're able to use that directly for epi support, but that might be an opportunity as well. Oh yeah, they you know many many programs have epidemiologists who 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 work with them directly. It's just not uh, something that it's not a standalone thing that SAMHSA has has envisioned. They absolutely block grants are used to fund epi uh, salaries, no doubt about it. Um. And then uh, another question from one of our folks working on, on the Navajo Reservation. So uh, are you aware of any efforts to improve access to inpatient rehabilitative services on Native American reservations? Mm. Well, Specific question to this. yeah, the, I, my, my thought on that initially is a number of our funding opportunities go um, un, underutilized, especially, it, this is an issue that, that we've had in several of our regions specific to funding opportunities that a tribe might be eligible for. I, what, the feedback that I've heard from some of my, my contacts in Region 4 is that these, the, the grant announcements will come out and they may not be aware that they came out, or they may not have the staff to write the the grant application to complete the application. So they, they, there there are barriers to accessing some of the funds which could address that need. Uh, and I, w one of the barriers is just not knowing who pays for like new buildings, and then who could staff that building. Like you know, USDA has a number of different grant opportunities that uh, that fund the creation like of facilities that can fund vans that can be used to literally build an inpatient hospital facility and then you could use SAMHSA funding for some other needs related to that facility but it, it requires uh, first just an awareness that those funding opportunities are out there and then also personnel that are willing and able to apply for them. And so one of the things that we do in Region 4 is try to support our tribes in applying for anything they want to apply for and then getting the word out about opportunities. And that's this has been a, a challenge historically to, to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And it's not just tribes, like states often miss opportunities that they they could benefit from. So if if anyone has questions about that, you know, go to that that grants link on our website. Uh, contact the regional administrator in your region. If it's me, give me a call. Uh, I'll help you find resources, whether it's at SAMHSA or somewhere else. Because a lot of times it's not just with SAMHSA. You need a strategy of braided funding. You need you need SAMHSA funding. Maybe you'll need HUD funding. Maybe you'll need uh, USDA funding. You know, there are so many different opportunities. We just need to um, use the ones that are there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree. I think it's really difficult um, to be a person that weaves together a lot of different funding streams, and it's, it's an art, it's an incredible art. Um, um, uh, there's no more questions in the chat box, but I, I did have one final question to close this out. Can you talk a little bit about what the most difficult part of being a regional administrator is, and what's the part is you most enjoy? Ah, uh, wow. 
Huh. So I, for me, coming from um, a applied epi world, I really like the idea of measuring stuff. And I think the, the hardest part for me has been realizing that I can't always measure the stuff that I want to measure in, in the world of behavioral health. You know, a lot of the stuff that regional administrators do is related to relationships. Like everyone listening to this webinar right now, uh, I, I would love to have a follow-up conversation at some point with every one of you, because that's really my job. Um, but it's tough to measure that or the outcome of that, the impact of it, right? I can't see how that changes an attack rate or whatever. Um, and so that, that's been my struggle, like figuring out how I can do my job in a, in a systematic way and, and really measure the, the help that I'm providing to people. Because, you know, I want to make sure people get what they need to do their job. And that, so that's a different task than I had at CDC. Uh, but, it, or, but it's also the same task, just on a broader scale and with different outcomes. Uh, the thing that I enjoy the most is seeing other successes, like getting to see the, the way communities are coming together successfully and leveraging their resources. When, when I share a resource that somebody didn't know about, when someone says, hey, I saw that silly webinar you did and I clicked on that link and suddenly it was just what I needed. I was like, that, those moments are the reason I love this job because government doesn't do a lot of things well, but a couple of the things we do really well are bring people together in meetings and convenings and then we share information. So if I can do those things well and I see the, the fruits of those labors, then I feel like I've done my job um, at least up to a certain point and I can always do better. So if you guys have suggestions for how I could better share some of this information, if I can make my show and tell more entertaining, uh, or if, you, if any of you use any of these resources, if you take those action steps, like you know connecting with a partner in the next month or today downloading one of those materials or at least looking at those materials or marking your calendar. If any of that ends up being beneficial to you, please send me an email and just let me know. I'd, I'd really like to hear. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. What, what's your email address again? So it is michael.king at hhs dot go, uh, at samsa dot hhs dot gov. Sorry, look at that. I was just gonna about to mess it up. Hold on, I'll go back all the way through, dun, dun, dun. all the way through my presentation background. SAMHSA.hhs.gov. Going back. We're going backwards. You mentioned is on slide six. It talks about the regional and local program or the logistics and infrastructure of SAMHSA. Yeah. You think I would go all the way back? Dun, dun, dun. Here we are. Ha. Huh. Michael Dot King at SAMHSA.hhs.gov. Okay. I'm going to remember to put that at the well, end next time, too. That's all right. Please feel free to, to email Dr. King. And, and uh, thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate uh, all the things that you're doing at SAMHSA and, and really, really, truly have enjoyed just working with you and, and being able to, to be around. So um, with that, we're going to close out our presentation for today. I'd like you to join us April 1st, no fooling for um, our next preventive medicine grand rounds. And we're gonna focus on early childhood ex experiences. Uh, and that will be led by uh, some of the staff over at the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control here at CDC. Until then, we hope you all have a great day and a great rest of your month. And uh, thank you so much again, Michael. We'll take care. And thank you, sir. You.